Good morning, everybody. Let's all gather around as we get into God's Word this morning. Praise God. Amen. So this winter thing can't just decide what it wants to do, right? Winter, spring. They're fighting right now, and I hope spring wins. Amen. I'm ready for it to be. We got a hint of it not long ago, right? Some of you broke your shorts out too soon, and uh, but that's okay. I have small closets, so I have to put my some stuff upstairs, some down, and uh, and and so I've got some of both now in my wardrobe, and it's packed so tight with winter and you know, warmer weather stuff, right? And uh, you know the saying in North Carolina: if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute, just wait a minute, amen. Just wait a minute. Praise God. All right. Well, let's get into this this morning. Father, thank you again for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to come together and worship you and to be in your presence as as your body. Now, Father, as we get into the word, will you illuminate our hearts and minds? Will you speak to us, through us and to us to hear what you want us to hear? We'll walk out today just being able to say it is just so good to be in the house of the Lord. And we thank you, praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Uh, let's see. I'm 55. I say that every now and then. You know, I'm only going to be 55 once, right? In August, I'll be 56. But I'm 55. I've been thinking about this for the last few days. Um, I don't know that I have ever personally experienced the season that I'm in in my life. Like, I'm not saying I'm all the way in, and I'm not even saying that I stay there every day, but Hebrews tells us to labor, therefore, that we enter into that rest. He says, because there is now, therefore, a rest for the children of God. And that word rest, as you've heard us say recently, is the word sabbatismos, and it means special rest. And this is different than any other word in scripture before or after it's very unique and it's very special and it's a special place and it's really hard to describe it when you enter into the place of rest and and again i'm not saying i'm always there but but i've 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 frequented this place more than i ever have in my life and it's different it's different Uh, there's a lot of believers that are going to heaven but they've never entered into this place of rest, this sabbatismos, this special place of rest, going to heaven. Um, but going to heaven is wonderful. Praise God. But, you know, I mean, when's that going to happen for you? You know what I mean? I, I hope it's a while, you know. I hope it doesn't happen quick or soon. But but while you're here for the number of days that you have here, the Lord wants to do things in you and through you through this place of rest. And the beauty, of, and the, here's the place of rest. It's marked by us ceasing from our labor, and we probably do more work and have more going on than ever, yet it is not us doing it, but the Lord is doing it in us and through our lives. And you've heard me talk about the three phases of the Christian life, which are marked by and is is is, is typed by the three feasts of the children of Israel, the feast of Passover, which which really marks the 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 experience of salvation for every believer when you come out of Egypt, which is a type and shadow of the world, and you you are born again, and you're born again by the blood of the lamb. And so they place the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their home in the shape of a cross. They didn't even know about the cross coming one day. And, and that's how we get to heaven. That's how we are born again. We come out of Egypt and the world, and we are saved by the blood of the lamb, right? And not only are we saved and going to heaven, but David painted a beautiful picture in Psalm. He says, they came out with the gold and the silver, and there was not one sickly among them. In other words, they came out saved, but they came out really saved. And that's the problem with a lot of us in the body of Christ. We don't even know how saved we really are. That's what the book is about. I'd love for you to get one. You can't buy it today. We just want to give you one free. But it talks about how saved you really are. Like Jesus did such a complete work on the cross for you. And it wasn't just to get you to heaven one day, but he wants you to experience this abundant life that he came and that he speaks of in John 10.10. 10. And the abundant life doesn't mean you're going to live in a mansion necessarily or, or uh, uh, on the beautiful seashores of life and that you'll never have a problem. It doesn't mean that, but it means he wants you walking in a level of wholeness where there is nothing missing and there's nothing broken. And he has that for you. And they, they did that coming out of Egypt. 
But then they were, went right to, uh, they went to Mount Sinai. And even today, uh, Israelis uh, practicing Jews, they practice the Feast of Pentecost every year. It's the third feast that they practice, the second feast that they practice. It's called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Pentecost. And it represents when Moses received the law and he gave it to the children of Israel. But it's a picture of you and me of us coming to an understanding of the power of the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is you just are not designed to live the Christian life in your own power. You can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can do it in you and through you. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I know among some that's controversial. But if it's okay to say the words of Jesus, Jesus said that several times. I mean, if I would be okay saying things Jesus said, then let me just say it. Jesus says, hey, he says, John baptizes you with water. He said, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire not many days from now. He's telling his disciples, the Holy Spirit has been with you, but not many days from now, he's going to be in you. And there's a difference between with and in. With means paraclete, walking alongside. But in means it is, you've been marked. I mean, it's like taking again that white cloth and dipping it in a red tank uh, of wine or juice or something of that nature. You bring it back out and you may wash it, but it will never be the same. It will always be marked with that baptism. And that's what the Lord wants. And you need to be filled and ongoingly filled with the Holy Spirit. And you need to rely on the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. And see, you can't do that when you don't even know the Holy Spirit exists. When all you think the Holy Spirit does is convict you of sin, then you can't tap into the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life, right? And then there's that third feast that's represented. And you can see this whole pattern in the children of Israel from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And then as they crossed the Jordan River and they went into the promised land, which is marked by the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, one phrase or one description is called the, 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 the Feast of Second Harvest or the Feast of Tabernacles. And what does this speak of? It speaks of that when that generation, that second generation of Israelites, Hebrews, crossed over the Jordan River, they have a new leader now, and his name is Joshua. Uh, Moses wasn't the one to lead them into the promise. And I was thinking about this yesterday. You know, uh, we, we have a free will, but, uh, but th there's, some, there's something about the mix of God's free will and um, God's, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase I'm looking for. It's a doctrinal phrase. Um, do God's, uh, oh, somebody help me. Um, what? That's it. God's will and God's sovereignty, our free will and God's sovereignty. And, you know, the Lord wanted the children of Israel to cross into the promised land, that first group that came out of Egypt, but they would not. They believed the evil report, which was a factual report that there were many giants in the land. There were fortified walled cities, and they felt like grasshoppers in the sight of these giants, right? But two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, says, no, uh, yes, we agree. There are, they're out there, but we are well able to take the land. Let's go at once. But that generation could not... And, and I thought about it. They chose not. God called it the great day of sin and rebellion. They chose not, and they could not. But here's the other piece of that. They weren't even supposed to. You know why? Because the law came through Moses, Paul says, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And if we're talking types and shadows, listen, the law if you are if you are a follower of the law, you're all about the law this and the law that, that will never get you into the promised land. It, in fact, it'll keep you out. It'll keep you wandering around the wilderness because it takes following Jesus, and Joshua was a type and shadow of Jesus, and they, they have the same name, Yeshua, and it takes Joshua to lead us into the promised land. So when this second generation is facing the Jordan River and the priest of God step into the river and Joshua gives instructions to the people, follow the ark of God and follow the priest closely, that represented the movement of Jesus because he says, we've never passed this way before. As they followed the ark, the priest step into the water, the Jordan River opens up and they cross over onto dry ground. And now they're in the promised land. Now, do you know that one of the tribes wouldn't go in? They said, hey, we'll go over there and fight for you, with you, but when it's all done, we're going to come back on this side. You can't get everybody across, so don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Everybody ain't going with you. You just need to make sure you get over there for yourself. Amen? Now, you'll bring some, but you won't bring everybody, okay? So that's okay. 
right? And that's what happened. They crossed over into the promised land. You know what they did? They moved in houses they didn't build. They drank from wells they didn't dig. They drank wine from vineyards they didn't plant. They ate from gardens they didn't plant. I mean, they, they lived a good life. And Ephesians tells us that God has prepared the good life for you and for me. He has prepared for us the good life. Here's how you get to the good life. The good life is the God life. And my definition of the good life for you and yours for me may not be the same, and it doesn't have to be, and it really won't be. And the good life, though, is you being in the center of God's perfect will and plan for you, whatever that may be, and that you're walking in it. And, and, and nothing, no devil in hell, nor you yourself, you're not going to let yourself stay on the other side of the Jordan. You're going to get into that promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And it doesn't mean you don't work over there. You'll probably work more than you've ever worked in your life. But the difference is, is God is doing it through you versus you doing it in your own power. There's many people working, working, working. They're doing many things. It's pictured in Mary and Martha, right? Martha's busy preparing the meal, and she gets mad at her sister, and she starts to snap at Jesus. Hey, will you tell her to come help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Martha. Reminds me of the Brady Bunch, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Martha, 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 you're fretting over many things, but Mary's chosen the best thing, and it will not be taken from her. That's a picture of the promised land, and it's the place of rest. You probably will do more work, but you'll be doing it having ceased from your labor, and God's doing it in you and through you. And so I can just say personally, I'm seeing more things happen, and multiple things happen at the same time. That is beyond my ability to do, control, manage, or any of it. Yet I feel the, the Lord in my life doing those things in me and through me. And it's because of, I feel like he's given me a greater awareness of this Feast of Tabernacles and entering into and staying. And, and the writer of Hebrews says, like, if you're going to work at anything, you labor to stay in this rest. So I have challenges. I have opposition but I choose not to stay there. Amen. You don't have to stay there. Come on now. You may face some stuff, but that don't mean it's right. You keep moving forward. Amen. Into all God has for you. Amen. And you're going to go through some things. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Listen, you are an overcomer and you're going to go through something every now and then, but you are still an overcomer. In Jesus' name, amen. And that is the beautiful picture of the promised land. But here's how we get there. You ready? We get there by following Jesus. We follow Jesus all the way. And this morning, I want to share with you just three simple things. I'm going to read some verses to you, but I want to share three simple things. And here's, here's the thing. You ready? Three blessings to following Jesus. Now, there are many blessings for following Jesus, okay? But this morning, we're going to look at three Three blessings to following Jesus, and we're taking it from this picture of Joshua leading the children of Israel into the promised land. You ready for this? Let's, see, or let's read some scripture. Let me just go and give you the first one, and then we'll read about it. You ready? Here's the first one. You ready for this? The first blessing to following Jesus is you will see the hand of the Lord in your life, and he will make you a solid witness. It's really twofold, but it's wrapped into one. In other words, he'll do great things in your life, and that those great things will be a witness. Now, let's look at this in Scripture. In Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, we pick up the story, okay? The children of Israel are about to cross the Jordan River and step into the promised land. And in Joshua 4, 1 through 14, it says this. When all of the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now, choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan and carry them out and pile them up at the place where, I, where you will camp tonight. So he's saying, hey, as you're crossing, I want 12 men to grab 12 stones from right there in the middle of the river where the priests are standing and the waters have parted. 
So Joshua called together the 12 men that he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in the ark, uh, in front of the ark of the Lord. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on his shoulders. So these weren't pebbles. These were big stones. They had to carry them on their shoulders. Carry them on your shoulders. Let's see, where was it? Verse what? Somebody help me. What verse is that? That's verse number five. All right, here we go. He told them, go in the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark. Yep, da, 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 da. Verse six, he says this, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each of the tribes, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and, and constructed the memorial there. Joshua also set up, now here's the second part, Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan, in the middle of the Jordan River, at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. The priests who were carrying the ark stood in the middle of the river until all, the Lord's uh, all of the Lord's commands that Moses had given to Joshua were carried out. Meanwhile, the people hurried across the riverbed, and when everyone was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the ark of the Lord as the people watched. The armed warriors from the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh led the Israelites across the Jordan just as Moses had directed. These armed men were about 40,000 strong. They were ready for battle, and the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho. That day, the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of the Israelites, and for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they revered Moses. So here's what we see. You ready? This is God's instructions. I love this. This is God's instructions to Israel. He says, hey, here's what you're going to do. When the priests are in the middle of the, uh, the river and the waters have parted on both sides, I want two sets of men. Grab the first set of stones and carry these stones out on your shoulder, and we're going to set up a memorial at a place. We're going to talk about that place here in just a moment. And then, but before they all cross, all the children of Israel, there's probably roughly 2 million or more people that crossed by, that passed by, that took a minute, okay? And then they all get on the other side of the river. Now Joshua sets up another stack of 12 stones in the middle of the riverbed, and then the waters cross back over and cover them up. And the word of God says they still stand to this day. I think there's a likelihood you could find them. If you knew where the spot was, they're probably still there. They're probably still there to this day. Amen. Now, you could read those stories, that story in particular, and not even think much about this. But here's what the Lord showed me, and this is what I've, I've seen here in the Scripture. And that is this. Listen, it's one thing to know what God did for your grandma and your granddaddy and your mom and them and this person and that person. But you need to know what God's done in your life. Amen. I'm grateful for what God did in Mamie B. Jones's life, who, who I can tell you right now, my spiritual heritage came through Mamie B. Jones. Her father was Papa Kurt. They got a hold of what had happened at the Azusa Street Revival in California. Somehow it got to them, and they started believing in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I will never, ever be less than grateful for that heritage. And I'm grateful for what God did in Edward Mumford's life after he got saved. He, he had some things that he wanted to do, and he gave sacrificially, and I'm reaping the benefits of some offerings that he sowed through his life. I'm reaping those benefits today. And listen, neither one of those people, maybe B. Jones or Edward Mumford, would have ever walked the walk they walked had they not had a personal encounter with God. Amen? Now, I'm one of Mamie's last grandchildren, but I'm Edward, Jones, uh, Edward Mumford's first grandchild, right? but I needed my own personal experiences with God. And at 55 years old, I've had them. Last year, I started keeping a journal for the very first time, just writing things down that God was doing and saying to me. And I'm amazed. Like I did my first one last year, and I just keep it on my phone. And just the stuff 
the things he says and sh- shows me and does. And I don't know who will read that after I'm gone. But listen, that's a memorial to what has happened in my own life. And as grateful as I am of what God has done, I can read God's word and I'm grateful for the book of Acts and I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for that, but I need to see God moving in my own life. I need my own stories. And as great as it was that the Red Sea parted from mom and dad, these children of Israel needed it to happen for them as well and God did it for them at the Jordan River. And then they set up a stack of 12 stones in the middle and then they stack up another 12 stones on the edge of the shore or where they can't. And later we're going to see as we read a verse, he says, he says, he says, now this stack of stones that everybody can see, it'll serve as a witness when your children ask, hey, what are these stones for? You'll be able to say, we read that, you'll be able to say, hey, this marks what God did for us when he led us across the Jordan River on dry ground. Isn't that awesome? But here's the cool part. You ready for this? There is no outward memorial until there's first an inward memorial. If you don't let God do an inward work in your life, the outward thing will never, it'll never be there. And this is the struggle for a lot of Christians. They won't let go of bitterness. The spirit of Jezebel is rampant in the body of Christ today. I'm telling you straight up. Paul says, you're going to know you in the last days, Timothy, when men are lovers of themselves more than God. I'm telling you, that spirit don't like me. You know why? Because I hate it. I don't hate people, but I hate that spirit, and I have no tolerance for it, period, whatsoever, because it's destructive. And there's many people, they won't let God do an inside work. They're going to heaven, but they're, they're, they're full of contempt. There's a wrong spirit about them. You can pick it up when you're around them. I detest it in the name of Jesus, and I won't tolerate it. I won't tolerate it because it's not to be tolerated because they're not allowing the inside job to happen first. And when you get around them, they're quirky. They'll speak to you half the time. The other half, they won't. Amen? You don't ever know what kind of mood they're in. That ain't God. Where's God at in that? He ain't nowhere in that. Because, listen, you got to let God do the inside job so someone can see something on the outside of you. And if you're so full of yourself that you won't let God do something on the inside, I'm telling you right now, you don't need to be at this church. You need to find you another one, okay, because you ain't going to be happy here, okay? And I'm not talking to anybody. I'm talking to the devil, amen, because that's the devil at work. But let me tell you something. As God works through people, so our adversary has to work through people. And this is why Paul tells us, listen, you're not battling flesh and blood. You're battling principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. But here's the deal. We get to choose who we allow to work through us. Are we going to allow our Heavenly Father to work through us? Are we going to allow the devil to work through us? And many, listen, and many God-loving believers are going to heaven. They've never let God do an inside job. And so they're not a solid witness on the outside. Nobody wants what they got because they're not even happy themselves. Now, I'm just being honest with you. And listen, that's where it starts. The fake it to the make it thing don't really work. You can fake it all you want, but if you ain't got it solid on the inside, it's not a real memorial on the outside. Amen? And this is why following Jesus and his word is so important. Listen to me. When we follow Jesus, listen, we will see the hand of God working in our lives. You'll have your stories. But but listen, he'll also make you a solid witness to others. Amen. Heather's going to be baptized here in just a few minutes. Heather works at the bank. Heather is an adult. Do you know what the likelihood of adults, do you know what the percentile of adults coming to Christ is? It is extremely low. We have been blessed. You'll be the 10th person that we've seen baptized this year. And that is not our boast. That is not our boast. Listen, our boast is in the Lord, okay? Our boast is in the Lord, okay? Because, like, we didn't see that coming, right? But we're so grateful. And in that group, we've seen many adults be baptized over the last, we're in our seventh year at Harbor Church. The likelihood of that is very small. That's why kids' ministry and children's ministry and youth ministry is vitally important because you run a much higher 
uh, chance of winning a young person to Christ than you do an adult. So, and I don't really know. I haven't had coffee with Heather. I don't really know. I see her at the bank. She's often my teller at the bank. When I go in the bank, it's where, I, it's where we bank, okay? But something's happened, and Heather has picked up on something in somebody's life that's made her say, I want that. I, I want that. I'm not saying it's me. It may not be me at all, but it's been somebody. Somebody had an outward memorial that said in her heart and mind, I don't know exactly how they're rolling or what's going on there, but I want that. And she's given her heart and life to Jesus, and she's being baptized today. Amen. And so let me help you, okay? If you don't have something on the outside that the world says I want, then you need to check the inside. Because there's nothing on the inside if you don't have what's on the outside. And you don't even have to worry about the outside. If the inside part is there, the outside part is going to be there, I promise you. But all that happens when you follow Jesus. You ain't following your stuff. You ain't following your attitude. You ain't following your little self. You ain't following the devil. You're following Jesus. Amen. And I know I'm being strong. Amen. But you know what? We need that. Amen. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. Christians are going crazy. I'm dealing with it right and left. I oftentimes, I, I, I stay way more in battles with Christians than I do the world. I'm just being honest with you. And I, I, it's okay. It's just part of, the, it's part of the thing, man. It's okay. But I'm telling you, I'm not stopping and I'm not settling. I'm not going to get in your party of wrong when I know what God's word says is right. I'm going to stick with Jesus. Amen. And that's going to cost you some relationships sometimes. It's going to cost you some friendships. It's going to cost you some stuff. So be it. I'm going to follow Jesus. As for me and my house, these are Joshua's words. You ready? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to follow Jesus every step of the way. You can do whatever you want. I hope you do the right thing, but I'm just telling you what we're going to do, okay? If you want to keep up with the Joneses, okay, who came up with that, I can just tell you what we're going to do. We're going to follow the Lord. And I don't mean we're going to always get it right. I don't mean we're going to be perfect along the way. But you know what I can say? If Paul could say it, I should be able to say it. Follow me as I follow Christ. You ought to be able to say that. You follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not perfect. He's the perfect one. But I can tell you I'm going to follow him. And sometimes you've got to check yourself. When you start getting a wrong heart and a wrong spirit and an attitude within yourself, let the Holy Spirit work you, man. That's one of our points coming up. That's what he promises he'll do. There'll be an inside memorial that will reflect the outside memorial when you follow Jesus because he wants to lead you into the promised land. Amen. He wants to lead you to the promised land. Here's the next thing that happens. When you follow the Lord into the promised land, here's the next thing that happens. I love this. In verse 15, in verse 15, scroll on down to the second point. When we follow Jesus, listen, God's word, which is Jesus, will change our hearts. What am I talking? I'm not even going to read the whole, the whole verses here, but here's what happened. Let me just read this first part. You ready for this? Listen to this. When we follow Jesus, here's point number two. God's word, Jesus, will change our heart. Now, why am I putting Jesus here? Because in the beginning was the word The word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the word. Psalm says, God sent his word and healed them. Do you know what Jesus' name was? I met a guy this week. He's got an Arabic name, but his Arabic name is Jesus. I know a guy, Hispanic guy. His name is Jesus. It's spelled the same way, right? Uh, uh, In in Hebrew, it's the word Yahshua, okay? Uh, My my point is this. uh, That's Jesus' earthly name. That was Jesus Christ's earthly name. But do you know what he was when he existed before time happened? He was the word. When God said, let there be light, you know who was, you know who, you know who the, you know what he was saying? Word, make light. The Bible says that all things exist through Jesus, that in him, that in him dwelleth all things, that he holdeth, listen, that he holdeth, what in the world? That he holdeth all things together. All right, now, we made a devil mad, didn't we? We did. It says, it says, listen, in him he holdeth all things together. You feel me? 
Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's the Word, and He's the truth. So He's the Word. So when you get up and you read God's Word, you're not just reading some black and white words on a piece of paper. This is a person, and His name is Jesus. Amen? And Jesus, through His Word, has the power to transform our lives. Isn't that amazing? Listen to this. Listen to this. Here's what happened. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 4, listen to what happened. They crossed the Jordan River. They set up those 12 stones, one in the river, one over there at another place called Gilgal. It's called Gilgal. And here's what happened. It says, when all of the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all of the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, here's what happened when they heard about it. Listen to this. They lost heart and they were paralyzed with fear because of them. So all of the kings that they were getting ready to go invade their cities and invade their towns because they're taking out, they're driving out the devil's people and they're going to occupy the promised land. All of the kings of their cities, the Bible says their hearts failed them. Their hearts sank because they were afraid of the people of God. Wow. In fact, Joshua sent out two spies, and you know the story at Jericho. Rahab took them in her house, and she said, listen, our city's on lockdown because we're afraid of thee. We know that, that, that your God is the God, and we know this, and we're afraid of thee. And, and they went back home, and they told Joshua everything that had happened. Isn't that interesting? And the whole time, that's the way God had seen. Listen, that's the way God would have been the moment cross the river and let's go take the cities but you know what god did instead instead of in that moment running and taking the cities you know what he did he said joshua i want you to reinstitute something that has died among my people and i want you to reinstitute circumcision he said i want every male in camp every male in israel to be circumcised and then if you were to read the verses right here in joshua chapter 4 he says because none of them were circumcised after they left egypt now what has this got to do with anything when god made an abrahamic covenant when he made the promise to abraham he said abraham i'm gonna bless you and i'm gonna bless your children and i mean he just promised abraham all these blessings and listen you are heirs to the promise of abraham he says this is your portion of the of the covenant you and every male in your household must be circumcised. And so Abraham did it. I'm like, what's that got to do with anything? Here's what it's got to do with. You ready? Paul talks about in the New Testament the circumcision of our heart. He says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And last week I read to you in Hebrews about, about the children of Israel crossing over into the promised land. Listen, and right after that, here's a verse for you. You ready? Right after that, here's a verse for you. He says this. I don't even have it here with me. I thought I did. He says, listen, he says, the word of God is quicker and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce and create the division between soul and spirit. When we follow Jesus, listen, into the promised land, here's what he does. Put that point back up. He changes our heart if you have developed a hardness to the word of god in your life and you can read something and it never changes you anymore you got to check that because listen you got to let the word of god change your heart and it's not the word you like it's the word of god period and you got to rightly divide the word of truth you got to know what you're reading and how does it apply to you but here's the reality. The Word of God will change your heart. And it cuts the fleshiness off your heart. If you find yourself in a place where your flesh is ruling you, if your flesh is ruling you and affecting others, and let me tell you something. If you're a mom and dad and your flesh is ruling you, you always have victims, and your victims are your children. They'll have to put up with your fleshy heart because you can't get right, and they're going to be your victims. You don't want that. You want to lead your children into the promised land, and you want God's Word to change your heart and do surgery on the fly to you and for you and through you and in you, in Jesus' name. 
And you need that to happen before you go to try to before you go and try to take out the giants. You see, listen, listen. Every time we come together as a local church, no matter how many times I speak or share God's word, I want to do it as though it's the first time. I want to listen. I want to lean and rely upon the Lord as though it's the very first time it's ever happened. Why? Because you can't take for granted. You can't have a hard heart, and you've got to know without God's Word touching people, it is just words that you're throwing out into the atmosphere. Now, here's the last thing that will happen. You ready for this? Listen, God's Word changes your heart. It keeps you ready as you're moving out. But here's the last one. Listen to this. I love this one. Here's number three. When you follow Jesus into the promised land, here's what he does. Bring me up just a little bit right here. He will roll away the shame of your yesterdays. When you follow the Lord, listen, you'll have your own story. You'll see the divine hand of God in your life, and it will make you a real witness. As you continue to follow the Lord, listen, his word will change your heart. And here's the last piece. Listen, he'll roll away the shame of your yesterdays. Give me some more monitor back there. He'll roll away the shame of yours. The devil does not want this to happen today. Are you? Can you see that? Like there's been such a warfare this morning. Yesterday, uh, last Sunday was like so smooth, and today we're we're fighting. But we're not gonna worry about it, amen. Listen, this is when you know you're on something, amen. So you press through and you fight through, because these are life changing words, amen. Because here's what God wants to get you to. Are you ready? Listen, when you follow Him, He wants to roll away the shame of your yesterdays. They were out of Egypt. Mom and dad were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. And that's why that first generation could never cross into the promised land. Slavery, listen, they were out of slavery, but slavery wasn't out of them. Amen? Lisa is a historian, and she talks about, she talks about uh, uh, history, right? Do you know that after the Emancipation of Proclamation, it still took a few generations for people of color to know that they were really free? It took some generations that knew nothing about the slavery that great-grandma and great-grandpa had been through. It took a few generations. Because for the first generation or two, the, the people that were enslaved and the, and the children that had grew, grown up enslaved, they were out of slavery, but many of them didn't know who they were. And it took a while for the deceit down in them that, listen, you are really a free person. And that's what God wants to do to you. He who the Son sets free, listen to me, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And if you are not living in indeed freedom, listen, you need to look at that memorial. You need to make sure God is still able to cut away the fat and the fleshiness from your heart. Because what he wants to do at the end of the day is he wants to roll away the reproach of your yesterdays. When they set up that pile of 12 stones on the shore, they did it at a place called Gilgal. And Gilgal means to roll away. And he said to them after the circumcision, he says, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. You can never go into the promised land until you know who you are in Christ. You can never step into all that God has for you until you come to an understanding of who you really are in Christ. And religion is going to keep you from it. Religion is not going to teach you that. What I'm talking about right here today, I've never heard this growing up. When I talk about entering into the place of rest, I never heard that. All we heard about was serving, 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 and works, works, works. We were going to heaven, but we won't in no promised land. That's where God wants to get you. But it takes, listen, the inside job and the continual working of God's Word to cut away the fleshiness of our hearts, to get us to a place where that reproach is rolled away, and we no longer see ourselves as slaves and in bondage, but we see ourselves as those that are well able to take the land. Here's a couple of verses, and I'm going to leave you in closing. Listen to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Listen, the old is gone, and the new is here. Same verse in the Amplified. Play that song for me, if you will. Y'all play that song. Stay on that song for me. Listen to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, same verse in the Amplified. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he, that's you, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. And behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new life. Paul tells us to awaken to righteousness, awaken to righteousness, awaken to righteousness. Romans 8, 7 says this, it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. So how do you walk out that thing? Well, you stay in a more than conqueror status. You let God do the inside work that he wants to do. So that you're an outside witness to those around you. And you let God's word continue to cut the fleshiness away of your, from your heart. You remain teachable and you remind, you remain pliable like putty. Because at the end of the day, listen, he wants to do things in you and through you that you could never do in your own accord. And why does he want to do that? Because he, want to t- he wants to touch others' lives and he wants to receive the glory through your life. That's what it's about. Amen. Three benefits and blessings to follow Jesus. Listen, you'll see the hand of God in your life, and he'll make you a real witness. Number two, number two, listen, his word will cut away the flesh and keep your heart pure. And then third, he'll roll away the shame and the reproach of your yesterdays. So that you really begin to see yourself as more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you so. Amen. You might be out of Egypt, but is Egypt out of you? God wants it to be. He wants it to be. Here's the answer to this. You ready? Follow Jesus into the promised land because we've never passed this way before. Amen. Let's stand our feet. Give me some more volume on this mic right here. Give me some more volume on this mic. They're playing this song. We won't sing it, but the song goes like this. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. My granddaddy would say, you shouldn't sing a song in church if you don't really mean it. That, that was why he would say, Lewis, Lewis Jones said, you shouldn't sing it if you don't really mean it. Listen, but we can sing it and we can mean it. And that is, Lord, where you lead me, I will follow. Don't go with your heels digging in. Go walking and go marching and say, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'm going to follow. I may not understand everything. I may not understand everything that's out there in front of me. But I'm going to follow you because I know you don't want to just get me to heaven, which is wonderful. You want me to experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give me. And you want me to live and dwell in this place of rest to where you work through me and I've ceased from my labor. And that's what he wants to do for you today. Amen. Let's take communion together this morning.